I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. But before we get started, head over to my website, kalilareynolds.com to subscribe to our newsletter. And while you're there, you can check out our other financial news and videos. You can click the link up here or in the description box below. Now, come on, let's get this money. First up, NWC is aggressively pursuing delinquent customers. We'll hear from the president of the National Water Commission, Mark Barnett. And later, the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Several junior market companies are about to lose their tax benefits. How will they cope with the change? And Honeybun recorded their highest net profit to date, growing by 6% to nearly $167 million for the year ending September 2020. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark last week tabled three bills in Parliament designed to help the economy recover while still reducing debt. One of the three bills seeks to amend the Financial Administration and Audit Act to make government savings more manageable over the short to medium term. Under the fiscal rules, the government would have to save more in the next two fiscal years by not meeting its savings target this year due to the pandemic. The amendment aims to give them more room while still being consistent with attaining the 60% debt-to-GDP target in the next six to seven years. Dr. Clark also tabled legislation to facilitate the establishment of the Independent Fiscal Council to guard and monitor the fiscal rules. The third bill aims to allow the continued withdrawal of just over $11 billion annually from the National Housing Trust, NHT, to support the budget for the next five years. The annual contributions have been helping administrations meet their fiscal targets. The first doses of Pfizer Biotech's COVID-19 vaccine arrived in the United Kingdom, UK last week, just days after Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced that the nation had become the first Western country to authorize a coronavirus vaccine for general use. Eastern nations, including Russia, were the first set of nations overall to approve a vaccine. The UK's approval, however, is an important step towards containing the virus and having the world return to increased levels of normalcy. The UK has ordered 40 million doses, enough to vaccinate 20 million people, with two shots each. The first doses will be administered in the coming days, with priority being given to those most vulnerable. You are free to go to the beach or river. Well, at least until January 15 and between the hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., according to the latest disaster risk management orders. The relaxation, however, comes with rules by limiting activity to swimming and exercise, but prohibiting beach parties or group games. The authorities will, however, allow river rafting in limited scope and food and drink vending. Also during the period, zoos may operate between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., and parks, excluding amusement parks, water parks and water attractions, may operate between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 p.m., except on the public holidays. Sajikor Real Estate X Fund has sold its remaining jewel resort, Jewel Grand Montego Bay and Spa, but at a loss. The 217-room property was sold to a related entity, Sajikor Pooled Investment Fund Limited, managed by Sajikor Life Jamaica. The transaction took place on September 22 and generated inflows of $1.6 billion that the X Fund has used to reduce borrowings. The sale of the Montego Bay property leaves Sajikor X Fund holding one hotel asset, Doubletree by Hilton in Florida. Its other jewel properties were formerly sold to Playa Hotel and Resorts in a deal that gave X-Fund and Sagicor entities a stake in Playa. But in May, Playa also sold two jewel properties to unnamed investors for 60 million US dollars, well below their fair value of 85 million US dollars. Playa now holds two remaining jewel hotels and other hotels in Jamaica and the region. After months of ironing out technical glitches, JMMB Group has reported a return of full service to its online banking services via its Moneyline platform. The resolution comes in time to handle increased activity that normally comes with the Christmas season. The investment side of the platform was unaffected. Group CEO Keith Duncan said the adjustments done to the platform will reduce the amount of downtime the system requires on a daily basis. He also said enhancements were being done to the system to ensure optimal access to the platform going forward. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. And when we come back, we talk water.
This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agent, insurance made easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Welcome back to Taking Stock. The NWC says it's facing huge losses in revenue because of customers who refuse to pay their water bills. Joining us now is President of the National Water Commission, Mark Barnett. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Welcome to Taking Stock. Hi, Kalila. Thank you. I'm fine. I would say all the best for the season, but things are not so fine over at the NWC. I hear you're facing a huge energy bill. What's going on? Things have always not been fine at the NWC. A number of things. I, I don't think the energy issue is uh, anything new. It's just be because it's one of our larger costs in operating the business. Uh, it may have been construed to mean that a lot of what we're doing is focused to address that particular cost item, but it is not entirely correct. It is really to address all operational issues that we would have had and continue to have in terms of customer pay. That is really the issue. That's the nuts and crux of the matter. So how much is this bill? If we look at our energy costs over the over period, our energy cost straddles anywhere between five hundred and fifty million dollars per month, all the way up to about seven hundred, seven hundred and twenty-five million dollars per month, and that includes GCT as well, because NWC is also charge GCT and electricity. How are you charged GCT as a government agency? <laughs> I guess when JPS. Uh, when the government enacted GCT on electricity, NWC was never exempt. And not, be, not because we're the largest uh, customer, if you will, of J JPS, single largest customer virtue of our loading nationally. Uh, we were never exempt from being charged GCT. But that makes sense? Uh, you're, you're asking me questions that I probably <laughs> <laughs> can't really answer. I mean, the dictates of the day in terms of what is what GCT is imposed on is usually a determination by the ministry. Uh, the question, therefore, are we able to pay that uh, uh, that charge is another issue that has to be you know looked at. Uh, just to also highlight to you as well, NWC is one of the only government entity in the tax code where. NWC is named to pay corporate tax as well. You know what I always wondered, Mark, uh, uh, separate and apart from the entire COVID situation, yes. how is it that you are the provider of a commodity that everybody needs? It's not everybody needs water. It's not optional. It's not yes. even like electricity, which you, you would say you need it, but you don't necessarily need it to survive. You need water for survival. Yet you all always have financial difficulties. Why? I think one of the things we have to look at uh, is the history of water. There's a propensity amongst our population uh, where an enterprise is operated by government. There's a tendency to think that it ought to be a provision by government to the people, which means they don't pay. And so water is one of the cheapest utility commodity that you can ever uh, have. But yet still, the tendency to pay for it is always uh, very limited to a certain group of people. Uh, that is one of the things. It also has to do as well with how did we develop a water supply system in the past and to where we are now. Remember, we started out of the parish council system where basically everything was literally free. And... Uh, coming to an, an NWC wherein you are now asked to be a commercial entity to operate in a modality that really should be viable. I'm not going to even use the word profitable, but viable, where you can actually satisfy all your commitments on a regular basis. If you take the whole thing together, you recognize that there's a disparity in terms of was the population prepared properly for a commercialized government agency to provide water supply services and i think i don't think we we, we were uh, in addition to that you find other intervening things came in over the period wherein in the past you will say telephone was a luxury now it becomes a necessity and it is no longer considered as a luxury and people more gravitate towards that because of 
how easy it is to move and communicate. But water with is each not other. a luxury, and it's definitely a necessity. Absolutely. So that people just have the mentality that it ought to be free, that we shouldn't have to pay for water. Water should be is a social right. Very good point, Galila. Water, in fact, is a social right. And if you if you look at some of the UN um, publication, it does speak to every human being as a right to access a certain quantum of water. And that is correct. There's no there's no question about that. However, I believe beyond a certain um, consumption, that same human being must start to recognize the economic value of the product that you are actually consuming. We all can agree that the, 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 raw, product, the raw material that feeds into giving you potable water is relatively free. However, the processes and to take it to where you are comes at a cost, and that is where the dilemma is. But you're right, absolutely so the correct. the and the treatment and all that. Exactly, exactly. So that is what we're always saying, that is what needs to be paid for. To make it available to you, to give you the comfort that you require, to have it in your house, as, as opposed to you walking miles to collect it, that is what persons need to recognize and, uh, and uh, pay the cost for. But then that's not exactly what you pay for, because you pay for consumption. You don't pay a flat you, fee just to access the, the well, the, the, the consumption, the, the rate that that is used to determine your final uh, charges would take into consideration those costs item. But you're correct. You pay for consumption. And I must add, as you raise the point of consumption, domestic customers are cross-subsidized based on our rate. And it is no secret our commercial customers do create, uh, provide a subsidy for the domestic users. In addition to that, low consumption domestic users are also subsidized by higher consumption domestic users. So there's a cross subsidy across the bills that are the, the charges that even at the lowest rate, you're, you're paying not the economic value for the common commodity at all. And you really start to pay the economic value when you reach uh, upwards of five, 8,000 gallons uh, per month. Mm -hmm. I understand that the, the pandemic has worsened the situation, has exacerbated the situation, whereby you already had a lot of people who are not paying or have not been paying for yes. water. They are consumers, but not customers. Absolutely. How badly has the pandemic affected that? Oh, the pandemic had really hit us very hard uh, in the early part of the, 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 the pandemic when we started the initial shutdown. Our revenue dropped almost by $250 million per month. Our collection went down to as low as 69% uh, per month. Uh, when you go to that level, it does what's the average? What's the norm? So it went down to 69 We were just, we one. were over and about 88% collection to, to billing, meaning what we bill for one month versus what we collect um, in the following month, we were at about 88%. And the intention really is to move us up to at least 92%. Mm -hmm. But uh, with that, it does in, in fact create its, 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 its negative implications. So under normal circumstances, we would be collecting just about $2.3, $2.5 billion per month. We went down to as low as 1.7, 1.8, and we just now start to over close to $2.1 billion per month. So you would have seen a drop in cash of $300 million per month has a significant implication and a ripple effect uh, in terms of meeting some of our obligations. And how much does it cost you to run the entity? <laughs> uh, the question is, are we ever paying the full cost to do everything that we want to do? No, we don't. Our budget on an annual basis for expense is just about $30 billion. And $30 billion is just as a result of what we estimate to be what we would collect on a yearly basis. But if we were to really look at everything that needs to be done, it would cost us anywhere between $35, $40 billion per annum. 
So you get subsidized by the government. The difference is made up, or you just no. Have to we don't get subsidized by the government at all. You don't. No, we don't. So what we do, we match our expenses to coincide with what we are projecting to collect in revenue. So certain things would not necessarily get done. That's the bottom line of it. So since you're not collecting, you, your collections have fallen so drastically. That means you had you have had to make significant cuts over the past few months. Then we if that's we. The case. We have made adjustments, but the adjustments are not uh, significant enough to to really compensate for the losses because uh, there are certain fixed costs that you cannot uh, avoid. Our electricity cost is one. Our chemical cost is one. Our staff cost is another one, <clears throat> sorry, which we can't uh, avoid. And therefore, when you look at all those three items, those are the three biggest items. And in addition to that, when we have an escalating foreign exchange over the same period, so you're faced with, well, number one, we had a drought, which means my cost usually goes up. Then I have a, a, a fluctuating exchange rate, which means the spending power would have reduced in terms of my import for, for certain uh, critical items, pumps, etc. And at the same time, that same foreign exchange change would also affect my electricity bill. And it also create that additional cost in, in terms of a foreign exchange movement and something that we have no control over. So when you look between, from, from the beginning of the year to, to present, we have a foreign exchange loss of just about 1.5, uh, 1.4 billion, billion dollars. You mentioned drought just now and something yeah. I've always wondered, why is it that, okay, when we have drought, no water, yes. okay, fine. We understand that we're going to have water lockoffs, water restrictions right. and whatnot. But it's been raining and you still end up with water lockoffs, water restrictions and whatnot. Right. Why? So as it is now, we're in good stead. We have good stream flows. I, any disruption in service is not as a result of the unavailability of the uh, water. It would be some other reasons. Uh if we look at drought, there are a number of factors we have to con contend with. And it's not comforting for NWC or even myself to be leading an organization and knowing very well that we have the same repeated uh, in occurrences annually. But the challenge that exists is if you were to store as much of the water when it rains, where would I store it? And if you recognize as well, the city has developed in such a way that it was not developed with any careful plan to take care of water. And where we would have normally have storage, our possibility of storage, those areas are no longer uh, able to do that. And so the, the question therefore is where can this happen? There are technologies around, you could store your storm water runoff on, from your streets, your gullies underground it will come at a, a huge cost. It may be a necessary uh, activity to do, but obviously it would have to be stored at the lower end of the city and pumped back and under deep, deep, deep tunnels as, as well. But the, the fact of the matter is to combat drought, we definitely have to look at new facilities to bring that reliability in and, you know, give you that alternate. And that is what our earlier discussion or my earlier statement in terms of the agreement that we're working on is to do that. We also have to look at other water sources, whether we're going to do diesel, now the price is a little bit cheaper, that can help to impact. Desalination? Yeah. As in taking water from the sea and removing the salt? That's correct. How feasible yeah. is that? I heard that's very expensive to do. So we have actually looked at it about 15, 20 years ago but the cost of electricity was always a uh, the deterrent in, in moving forward. But now the efficiency of the system has, in, has improved over time. It's something that we're willing to look at again. Plus, there's a possibility of alternate energy to help to, to reduce your energy costs as part of the input to, to operate that system. Well, wouldn't so that are, be a very big capital investment up front? It would what require would a very plan? big, yes, and it, it is a big, big capital uh, outlay up front. It's usually, and again, it also has to do with what size facility can you put up to make it viable. And again, 
there's also the other side of it because this water is likely to be a little bit more expensive than the normal conventional, uh, so to speak, water that we produce. How wholesome is my network to, al to ensure that I'm not wasting more of this expensive water? And so those are always factors that has to be considered. So that would be something that the government would have, have to invest in as opposed to just the so, NWC, right? Because of the cost involved. <laughs> you, you, I smile because usually investment done in this in, in, in for capacity improvement is usually done by NWC with the support of government from the point of view government guarantee our government may loan us the funds to do these do do these work we may want to look at and i know there is the thinking of having private sector investment in the in the sector and more so having nwc morphed into a corporatized uh, enterprise so that may be an attractive uh, approach to get more investment into the nwc into these uh, new facilities but i don't i'm not seeing government going to take on an overtly leading role um, more so because of all the competing things and I and I want to say COVID really created its own issues both for us and, and and I know as a fact also for government. But coming back to the issue that I asked you about initially so I asked yeah. you about why is it that even when it rains NWC still have water lock off like last week I think I had lock off in my community uh, and it was raining, and it, is, that's the time that you all chose to so, clean out the tank or something like that. that no, wait, oh, that okay, given. so so one of the... So why you wait till it rain to yes. clean out tank? Why don't do so, that when it's dry? So the, the, no, when if I do it when it's dry, it's going to be even more chaotic because when it's dry, I have limited water, and everybody wants that available water. So when it's rain, I know my, and, I, and it's a time I really don't want to waste too much water because when I'm cleaning a, a storage tank, it simply means I'll have to use more water to wash it out, you know, scour, et cetera, et cetera. And that is better done during the time when I have a, a, a full, for example, a full Mona Reservoir or a full Hermitage Dam because utilizing that volume can be quickly replaced because of what is happening. But it was one of those uh, maintenance activity that had to be done because over time we have not taken out the facility and obviously we had gone through almost a year and a half of continuous uh, dry period with, with very little significant rainfall during those uh, months. And therefore it was opportune time now while we have uh, full storage, which we expect will continue until the end of the until the end of the year into into January to do that maintenance. It, it was not as a result of, not because of the availability of water in this instance, it was just a necessary uh, maintenance act activity that had to be done. So we shouldn't have any issue going into Christmas with water lock off? I am not seeing anything um, that suggests we should. Our storage uh, facilities are 100% and in some instance overflowing. So we expect everyone should be having a much better Christmas than they were two years ago. Uh, what we are mindful of that there could be disruption, you know, when we have a system where we had low flow during that dry period and we uh, now completely fill and pressurize all of those pipes, we're likely to have some disruption for breakages. But we'll try and maintain and minimize those as much as possible. Overall, we expect though, most, if not all, residents will have no disruption and see the benefit of the recent rains that has actually blessed us. So coming back to the current situation caused by yes. the pandemic, where you have a lot of customers not paying their water bills, some of them have been facing hardship and they just they can't, you know? Right. But you have made a decision at the NWC that you're going to start aggressively going after customers. What do you mean by that? You're going to start disconnecting people? We have started to disconnect. Yeah, we have started to disconnect people. What we have done, we were very, I want to say, you know, when you run an enterprise like this, everyone wants to know what is happening. So in the beginning of the pandemic, we made an internal decision and supported by the board that we're not disconnecting any customer during the period. 
But a lot of customers taking taken that for granted and don't really live up to their responsibility and pay their bills. And we know some persons had difficulty, and that is why we offered the three-month um, concession, if you will, to customers. And it was open to all customers. Uh, in the latter part, we offered it to, to, to commercial customers, which is small businesses. And I've seen quite a number of even medium-sized commercial enterprises taking up the, the offer as well. And so having given that level of concession and faced with the, 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 the reality that most customers having gotten that benefit still wasn't paying their bills. We took the decision that we are definitely going after every single customer, particularly those who would not have paid us during the period when we would have uh, granted the no disconnection, which we announced. And so consistent with our announcement of no disconnection, then we are telling the customers that we're coming after you, we're coming to collect as much as is possible uh, because of, you know, you just didn't hold up your end of the bargain when we, you know, gave you this, uh, I want to say, easy period for you to just be um, responsible. And the bargain was what exactly? They agreed that they would pay in full at a certain date? So it, it, it is not even... When you get a bill, it gives you a, a, a date for you to pay. It is understood that that bill would be paid on or before that due date. Uh, when persons don't do that, then we will likely disconnect some weeks after that. But in terms of what we had given up, given in, in, in the early part, I think it was between April to August, it was really, we gave 25% discount on whatever you would have owed up to May. And if you pay a certain portion, we can give you up to six months. And some customers even got up to 12 months to really clear the balance. Because we understand the challenges that, were, that, that most people face and continue to be facing. And so part of that process was to ensure we try to be as accommodating and reasonable under the circumstances where a lot of persons lost their jobs and persons earning power would have reduced and while expenses may, may still be, remain constant. So that is what we would have done over that period. So people just, so people just take advantage and um, so now the yeah. free ride done. You know, the, the, the thing that is so interesting about us here in Jamaica is that we like a free ride. We, we need to, right? we need to, you know, what, what is happening for me is when I travel and look at how people live elsewhere in the UK, in the US, bills are second nature to, to their existence. So whether they pay the gas bill, the light bill, the water bill, and in the UK, as you probably would be aware, it is council tax that these are TV, so you pay a TV tax. So it's not like you have a cable, which you can have separately, but you have a TV tax, just have a TV in your house, you pay a tax. Um, those things are paid as part of a normal course of living. In our society, it's about what can I get free? And, you know, this freeness mentality for a service that is vital to public health, to your whole life, it, it, it is really, really disheartening to know how we treat with it. So before we go, Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Had I heard talk at one point in time about NWC going to the stock market? <laughs> so yes, the, 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 the former chairman, currently Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Senator Hill, had mentioned that and mentioned it on a number of occasions. The idea, Kalila, is that NWC need to be restructured. And uh, I can just give you a simple approach. Of, uh, you heard me mention about corporatizing NWC. What it really means, we have to look at the overall NWC Act. We have to look at the whole debt structure within the NWC, the operational modality of NWC, the, the, the speed of which we can execute works, project, is always restricted by the laborious process of a government procurement um, schedule. And what it does, because it's a government entity, you have to be you have to abide by those uh, strictures in terms of the, the process. But once you have private sector investment involved and a private sector owning a majority portion of the equity in NWC or the shares in NWC, it kind of free you up to 
a lot more to do things and you become more agile in executing. So the idea that was put forward is one, we would look to see restructure the NWC, uh, issue shares in it, uh, invite financiers to be part of the, the makeup to own shares and invite a water operator to have shares and with government as a mi minority shareholder. But at the same time, we recognize the interests of the locals that has to be protected and there will be mechanisms. And that's what I was that, gonna come to because right. if you saw my face initially when I asked the question, I look kind of incredulous because A, that would mean that NWC has to be run as a for-profit organization, which right. being a social commodity, a social good that you are providing the social service, I don't know right. if it's best for an agency like the NWC. And then the other thing is, who would invest in a, an entity that just always has problems getting people <laughs> to pay their bills? Right. So I guess the same thing could have asked of, my, of JPS when JPS was government <laughs> because there was always a thing. But I, for some reason, and I think I don't want to say it, that it is a mental mentality issue. For some reason, once you have foreign people running certain company, our local people just seems to have a, a, have a propensity to respond a little differently. It's, 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 it's a sad statement to say, but it is a reality that I observe. But you're correct. One of the approach to that is because there's going to be the marginalized of society who still, even those who can pay but don't pay, but you're going to always have those who just can't pay for the service. How do you treat with those? And that is something that government, if you're privatized, would have to take stock of and more than likely create a line item in the budget to take care of those who just can't pay. But they... The, the concept really is there must be a safety net for the for those who are unable to pay. Uh, and the question is, how do you identify those and not actually bring everybody within the same within the, within the same grouping? And those who really should be benefiting don't get the benefit. Well, I want to thank you for joining me, Mark. All the best for the holiday season. I you hope too. People start paying. Ah, we wish. We we really are open. Uh, just to say, we are actually. Pushing again another promotion. This time we're offering about uh, uh, six laptops, 14 tablets as part of a promotion to see how we encourage payment uh, of the utility bill. But, but you have that to make sure people have reliable water too, even in rural and, and, areas. And, and, and you know, Kalila, it's so important. It's a chicken and egg situation. So because I give you the water a month ago and you don't pay for it now, it reduces my ability to continue to give it to you in the subsequent months. So, you you know, it is a chicken and eggs. I can't go on, on an overdraft to take care of my operational expenses. That is not allowed. But I know we, I know I said we were wrapping up, right? But it just baffles my mind that it's the year 2020 and there mm -hmm. are people in Jamaica who still don't have access to running water. People don't have access to running water in their yard is a fact uh, in some instances. My con my community where I grew up uh, had, is, have that challenge, which I'm trying to address really. But part of it is how do you we You don't start out your own community yet, Mark? It is in the process, man. It is in the process. Project is happening. The project is, is in place. Big, big end of the sea, President. Are your community <laughs> don't start I know you were going to jump on that, don't it? No, no but man. they... they we, we have a project that um, it has been delayed because of the heavy rain in the last, uh, for the last two weeks. But the project is well underway. The pipes have been laid, the pumps have been purchased. And so we will get that done at least. The intention is to give water to the community before Christmas and complete the entire project in early 2021. But the point you make, though, you know, is simple. Water ought to be the primary focus of any government, any set of politicians, because it has so much uh, positive impact on everything, you know, productivity, public health, economic growth. It, mm -hmm. it has so much thing, but we have never focused our investment to ensure that we secure the water supply for the nation. We need to get to 100%. We need to get to 100%. 100%. Supply. Everybody and has this to have water in their homes. And this That's cannot be possible. just by NWC alone, because NWC was never capitalized properly when it was uh, formed in 1980. It was never. So, so guys, if you're watching, that means you need to play your part and pay your bill. Thanks, Absolutely. Mark.
Thank you. All right. Up next, we've got your market recap, and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agent, Insurance Made Easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange declined with the combined index losing less than 1%. 103 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, December 4, 2020. 46 advanced, 45 declined and 12 stayed the same. 97 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $1.6 billion. Trans-Jamaican Highway traded the most, taking up nearly 18% of market volume. The stock gained $0.04 cents to open the week at $1.28. Wigton Wind Farm Ordinary shares traded at the second highest, with people buying and selling nearly 17 million shares in the company. The stock gained $0.01 cent to open the week at $0.74. Cents. And Barita Investments rounded out the most traded, taking up nearly 13% of market volume. The stock gained $6.18 to open the week at $88.99. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. Consolidated Bakers Jamaica jumped 21% to close last week at $1.48. JMMB Group 7.25% VR JMDCR preference shares rose 15% to close last week at $1.44. And Paramount Trading Jamaica stock advanced in nearly 14% to open this week at $1.50. On the losing side now, KLE Group fell 31% to close last week at $1. Sterling Investments fell 29% to end last week at $2.55 a share. And Sterling Investments USD lost 26% down to $0.02 cents US. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers and Proven Wealth. Welcome back to Taking Stock. It's time to examine the week in business. I'm joined by business writer at The Observer, David Rose. Hi, David. Looks like it's just me and you today. <laughs> Thanks, Galila. Yeah, sometimes. we're supposed to be joined by uh, Theodore Mitchell from JMMB. He's been having some technical issues. If he's able to join us during this interview, then we just let him in. And so, so for right now, at least, uh, perhaps for the rest of the interview, it's just you and I. But we do have stuff to discuss. I noticed, David, that quite a few junior market companies, because it's been now 10 years, more than 10 years since the junior market was established, and the tax benefits on the junior market last for 10 years. So some companies are coming on to the end of that tax benefit. Which are those companies and how will it, uh, how will it affect them? All right. So Jamaica Tees, Group Power, Access, the three last goes. And as of next week, you're going to have Cargo Handlers, Tax Break Expiring as well, and Dolphin Cobb later this month. So back in 2009, the junior market was established with a 10-year ta tax remission. But for the first five years, you got 100% uh, no income tax, apart from the minimum business tax at the time. And then uh, for the in five years, you get a 50% remission on your regular tax payable tax. So what will happen basically is that the companies have gotten their income, use, it, use that tax benefit to reinvest in the company and, um, and foster growth. What you're seeing right now is that companies are shifting from that full tax break back to, as you said, the regular operations. So right now what you're seeing is that some companies have, have done well in the sense that they're using the time wisely, are benefited off of it and are going to, even with the tax break being, being removed, some of them are, are thriving well, some of them not so much just because of the environment right now. And the funny thing is, the junior market almost ended in the, in the prior election. For 2016, it was, it was almost ended. Right. So I know that was one of the campaign issues. And also under the, the IMF agreement, the IMF had wanted the government to end those junior market benefits. But fortunately for those companies and for investors, the benefits continued. So are there any now, you said some are thriving, some not as well. Are there any now that are going to be at a, a pointed disadvantage because their tax break is coming to an end? For example, such as Lasco Financial Services and 
uh, access financial services. So they pay a, a relatively higher income tax compared to just regular companies. So in Jamaica, you have a regulated companies like a JPS, a financial services company, and those other entities, you pay 33.3% in income tax. But any other company is 25%. So they're going to be a relatively more disadvantaged position because they're going to be paying relatively higher compared to their peers in the junior market overall. But how have they been, but this, this is something that they knew was coming. How have they been planning for this eventuality? So, yeah, Alaska acquired uh, uh, Credit Scotia back in 2017-18 and Access acquired embassy loans in December 2018-2019. So it still played out in the sense that they took their time to you know, expand operations, uh, acquire several firms or build the branches operations and expand their product offering. So even Lasco is actually working on uh, the BOJ Sandbox to introduce a new product to basically facilitate payments for businesses online. So that's just one example of those who would come with disadvantage, trying to, as you would say, prepare for the eventuality. And then a company like Alaska Manufacturing, which had 41% growth in the current quarter, and remember, they, they had 50% remission still. So the next quarter, we see coming, they're going to take the hit. In terms of the extra 12.5% in income tax. But at the same time, their results have been growing significantly well because everybody's at home and the manufacturing companies have been benefiting that sense. So next year, you're going to see companies like Purity, Honeyborn, and others who are going to be using that tax break. But for some companies, they're in a good position to move forward in the sense that they don't have to worry about the tax negatively impacting the operations. Because they would have grown substantially in the past 10 years. They've had 10 years uh, to, to basically incubate, and so now they're in a position to manage those taxes. That's the idea? That's the idea, basically. So it was basically to foster growth. Because remember, before the junior market was created, it was always debt. So there was, uh, as you said, there was an environment to foster growth for smaller companies to go fur further. So that was a major concept, conceptualized idea for the junior market. And then the government was considering a micro junior market, a micro market just to, as they say, create an environment to facilitate business growth. But remember, companies come to market, get to equity, which is basically investors' money, use it to facilitate their expansion opportunities, and on top of the tax break, basically get them an opportunity to reinvest those, a quote unquote, safe tax back into the business to facilitate further growth. So it was a it was a great idea and it has served well in the sense that it's created so many more jobs and income for the government indirectly versus the tax they remitted over the 10 year period. And the funny thing about it is no company is fully off the hook as yet. So even though like 10 years have gone for access and the last goes, in the same sense, they have to remain listed for 15 years for those taxes to be fully remitted. So they're mm -hmm. going to get delisted before 15 years is up. The government could still come back and say, hey, you delisted early? All right, pay us our taxes. So the 10 years it was just there for the tax. They still have to remain listed on the JSE until 15 years have passed for the tax benefit to be fully baked in, as you want to call it that. Is there any benefit to transitioning to the main market once the, the tax benefits are expired or, or will most of them just remain on the junior market? What's the difference? So Jamaica Tees is willing to move to the main market because one of the limitations of in the junior market is a 500 million share cap. So when you want to send the junior market, you either between 50 million to 500 million dollars with respect to your share capital. However, if you actually surpass that amount, you have to actually move over to the main market. If you're, say, a company that the tax break has ended and you want to capitalize and raise more capital, they'd have to actually go to the main market if you want to raise more than $500 million with respect to your share capital base. And that's one of the reasons why Grace Kennedy took key to the main market as well, in the sense that the junior market side tax benefits, yes, benefit key on one side of the coin. But on the same side, you also are faced with the constraint of raising capital past $500 million. So based on what GK has said, and based on the current key's recent prices, you're potentially looking to raise a billion dollars in fresh equity. So that's what the major constraints in the sense of being listed in the junior market versus the main market. At the same time, the junior market companies pay less fees compared to main market companies. So there's that, I said there's that benefit of, you know, being able to raise more money and at the same time paying less in fees. It all varies. So they're one themselves have basically said, hey, we're going to the main market because we need to expand because they are having an APO very soon, 1.8 billion units, 
I mean, that two dollars, that's three point six billion dollars, well past five hundred million share cap. So that's just basically showing you that some companies are going to voluntarily move to the main market just because, as I said, they need to get that capital to really ramp up operations or cover even a liability. So for the case of Dermon, that would be their three hundred and twenty dollars of the preference share, which is coming due next March. So that's a consideration you can take it into play. You mentioned key insurance. So they're doing a renounceable rights issue. And viewers, you can click the link up here to see more about that on Money Mondays, JA. You also mentioned the moves to the to the junior market versus the main market. You also mentioned the moves between the main market and the junior market. I noticed that that's what Blue Power Group also did by spinning off Lumber Depot right as the, the, the tax break was about to end. But let's look at Honeybun's uh, latest results. David. So they're one of the companies that you mentioned just now. Their tax break is about to end. What are their latest financial results saying? So they released the art of financials for the year, and I think every day they generated about $1.6 billion in revenue and about $163 million in net profit. Year over year, it was about basically 6% for the top end revenue and about 8% for the bottom line in net profit. However, when you break it down and go into the quarter four results, that's where you see the magic happen. So for the, court, the fourth quarter, Honeybun's revenue went by 15%, $431 million. And their net profit went by 76% from $30 million to $54 million. And remember, this was a, I basically had it in an article that Honeybun basically, you know, no schools, no tourism basically to back pay off of. And remember, more persons are seen at home. So they have, as I would, as I must have realized that some persons that point to Honeybun has actually shifted their distribution system to reach their consumers differently. So sometimes they have a Honeybun shop coming to particular communities or going to different locations. And at the same time, Honeybun themselves have said that they plan to actually go into other business lines very soon. So I'm saying it's in the baking business alone, when we share bake and distribute their own goods, but I was considering a different business and they actually have a piece of land that they've acquired to go into that new business line. So what type of business line might that be? So outside of baking, you said, what type of business? Any indication? That's just it. They haven't, they haven't indicated as to what they're going to specifically go into. But it's, a pretty, it's pretty good for them in the sense that they're diverse and their business space, similarly to what you would have seen between Jamaica and QWI. In the right. sense that Jam T uh, split up their investment arm into another listed company uh, and basically expanded their, their diversification, their opportunities. Honeybun is going to consider something similar where they're going to go to a different business line. They have a property ready for it. Not sure what they're going to do, but it's pretty good in the sense that that brings up in June 2021. So for them to say ahead of time that, hey, we're going to go to a new business line with 300 million of cash on hand as pretty good opportunities coming in the near term. Well, we'll definitely be keeping our eyes peeled to see what happens with Honeybun in 2021. Thanks for your input, David. And they're also declared this and JC's uh, best practice awards, the best general company for 2019. So congratulations to them. Thanks again, David. Glad to be here, Kalila. All right. This segment of Taking Stock, the analysts, was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers and Proven Wealth. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and share with a friend. Also, subscribe to our newsletter at kalilorenals.com and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all of my videos. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. Now, this week on Money Mondays JA, we're looking at key insurances, upcoming rights issue. And on Money Moves JA, Dennis Chung is back to tell us how to implement our business strategy. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Also visit our website, kalilareynolds.com for financial news you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. Now tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Stay safe.